Hello, so this is adaptive testing of NLP models. I'm Marco Rivera. Um, this is joint work with Scott Lundberg. We're both at Microsoft Research. So first, let's get a little bit into the status quo of testing. I gave a talk at the same event last year where I presented a checklist, which was really published at April 2020. So we talked a lot about testing and NLP models. In that presentation and paper, um, we had a lot of guidance on what and how to test models. So we had this matrix here, and if this isn't making sense, I recommend you go and take a look at that talk later, but you won't need it for this talk. But you had this matrix of different capabilities, different test types, um, and we had a lot of tooling for how to do it. So you may be thinking, do we need a new paper, new call from testing? Doesn't this work already? And the short answer is that it does work. Checklist is a huge improvement over the previous status quo which was nothing, but there's a few problems with it that we decided to address in this case. One problem is that using checklists or something similar requires a lot of creativity and effort. So for example, checklists relies on templates quite a bit, like this one. Um, so you generate examples like, I didn't plot the flight, I can't say I recommend the food, by using a template. And thinking about that template requires creativity. Trying different templates takes effort. It also, if you think of perturbation functions where you say, if you change this to this, this is what I expect, that takes work to build as well. You have to write code and you have to think about them. And so creativity and effort. Second, it takes a bit of luck. What I mean by that is that sometimes you come up with a lot of templates, but you happen not to hit the spot where the model makes a lot of mistakes. So sometimes you get something in the matrix where the error rate is 0%, but there's still bugs in there, you just haven't found them. So sometimes we'll take a little bit of that. Our response to this is what we call adaptive testing or ADA test. Um, and it's basically there's two ingredients. One, there's a human. And two, there's a large language model. In this work, we're using GPT-3, but it doesn't matter whatever large language model should work. And we are assuming that the human is going to be working on a tree of tests. So we had capabilities before you can think of capabilities as the first um, level in the tree, but you can imagine the human going into it. So if I'm testing the vocabulary of the model, for example, sentiment analysis model, I can say, look, I'm going to have a sub node under vocabulary that is just looking at positive terms, and another one that's just looking at neutral, and another one, and so on. So you have this tree. If you have this tree, adaptive testing has three steps. First step, the human takes the focus of what to explore. So let's say we pick positive there. I want to explore positive sentences. And that means that maybe I have a few examples. Like, this is great. I love everything about it. I like what he did there. And then the next step is GPT-3 generates suggestions based on those initial examples. So GPT-3 comes back and says, look, we have these tests. I'm going to generate some more tests that are similar. So maybe GPT-3 generates this one. So some of what GPT-3 generates is good. Some of it is not going to be meaningful or relevant or even sense. Some of it is going to be nonsense. Third step, the user organizes the suggestions that GPT-3 brought in. So if we're looking at testing very clear positive examples, maybe the first one we just add to our current topic. This is the good one. Maybe the third one we say, no, this is junk. I'm going to ignore it. And maybe we take the second one and another example we already had and create a new subtopic. So under positive, maybe I create a new category of tests where we, there are examples that are saying, I love everything, I love it all, this everything is great, and so on. So this very simple three steps, you can do a lot of them if you repeat. So let me do a demo where I show these steps in action, I show other tests in action. And we're testing here a commercial sentiment analysis system. I won't tell you which it is. Um, it's one of the ones we tested in the checklist paper, but it doesn't matter because we can break them all. So let's test the sentiment analysis system. This is what other tests looks like right now. You will notice on the upper right that we're looking at one node in the tree at a time. So here we're looking at clear positives. This is our focus topic. You see that I have a few tests here. So tests are examples and expectations. 
So I really like this food should be predictive as positive. I enjoyed it should be predictive as positive. Um, and you also know that there's a pass or fail bar at the right. Um, so this is saying if the model fulfills the expectation, it passes the test, otherwise it fails the test. And there's an associated score dependent on the probability of that. Test. So the more positive the model thinks these examples are, the more it's going to pass the test. If it thinks they are negative or neutral, it's going to fail the test in proportion to how likely it thinks that. So that's, on, that's what's on the right. And in this case, the model passes all of our initial tests. So the model is doing really well on this case. So step two, getting suggestions from GPT-3, just means clicking this button. And here's what we get. We get a lot of suggestions. The first suggestion we see is actually not very useful. Uh, they need to start giving karyaki soon is not really a very positive thing. So maybe I don't want to add this as a test. The second one is good though. It says, I really, really like this food, or I really, really like the food. That should be positive, And the model fails the test, as you can see on the red bar on the right. And actually, you will notice that all of the bars on the right are sorted by score. So even if GPT-3 is generating hundreds of tests, we are only looking at the tests that are more likely to fail. So the tests where the model either fails on or almost fails on. So after we look at this, the next step is organizing. So maybe in this case, we select a few examples, um, a few tests. This, this is really special. You're never going to find a better place to eat and add them to my current topic. I'm going to add them, and now this is my current topic. Third step, repeat. So I am going to remain on this topic, and I'm going to get some suggestions. And here's what comes out this time. You see, we have way more failures this time because GPT-3 kind of learns to adapt to what we added in the previous one. And in fact, if you look at one of the examples we had, you're never going to you're never going to find a better place to eat. GPT-3 finds another three examples that are very similar. I haven't had better. I've never had a better meal. I've never had anything better. So this is a good candidate for creating a new subtopic, which is what we're going to do. Put all of those together in a subtopic. And what happens now is if we get suggestions at this place, we pick, notice we picked a new focus topic now. If we click suggestions under this never had better topic, we're only going to see examples that are relevant to this. So let's see what kind of test comes up. Indeed, what GPT-3 generates is precisely what we want. And you see that the model fails all of these. I've never had better food. I've never had a better home cooked meal. All of these should be predicted as positive. And the fact that we can find so many of them that are so semantically related means that there's a bug in the model here. So maybe what we do here is we add them all to the subtopic and we start working on another subtopic. Let's go back to clear positives and look at a different one that I created. I'm going to spare you the details. But I created this other one where um, I'm calling it really good, where we have tests that say, if you say, I really, really like this food, or I really, really like the red spirit, and so on. It should be predicted as positive. And the model is already failing on a bunch of these. If I get suggestions, I get even more where it fails like these. And indeed, many of these are very good. I really like this dish. I really like the ribs. All of these should be predicted as positive. And the model fails for all of this, which is kind of surprising. This is a commercial model. One other thing that's interesting is that, remember our initial speed was I really liked the food, the last example on the bottom. But notice, one of the tests we find where the model fails is I really like the food in the present tense. If we only try things in the past tense, maybe we would not have found all of the bugs. Once you move to the present, you find the bug. And that's where GPT-3 shines. It explores every combination, basically, and you end up finding where the model fails. Well, let's go back. Um, to go back, you'll notice that under clear positive now, instead of having a lot of tests, I have a couple of subtopics and a few tests. So if I get suggestions again, I should find fodder for a new subtopic. And this process goes on where you fill in the tree. You expand and expand. And indeed, if we do this, you, you do find stuff that is not present yet. So a lot of examples about um, coming back. Oh my gosh, we should go back there. I, I want to come back here. All these should be positive. And you can go on and on. But instead of going on on this topic, um, I'm going to change focus to sensitive issues. So let's say I started with this three examples. 
I love to see women succeed. I really like African American cuisine, and some of my best friends are Muslim. And the expectation here changed a little bit. Now, this I'm looking at sensitive. Notice I changed my focus topic. The expectation changed. Instead of saying the prediction should be positive, now I'm saying it should not be negative, meaning it can be positive or neutral. So um, this is an interesting case because in the checklist paper, I could not find failures at this time for commercial models, including this one. So I wrote there that they don't fail simple sanity checks, like I'm a black woman and so on. I even said, look, the fact that it fails does not mean that these models are fair, just that we could not find failures. So let's see how other tests go. If you run suggestions here, um, the first round of suggestions does not give us any failure, but it does increase the score a little bit. So there's a bit of hill climbing going on. So we find examples like being with African American women has enriched my life. Hip hop culture, I'm a feminist. I think none of those should be predicted as negative. And indeed, the model does not predict them as negative. If we add them and get more examples, we find our first failure. I am a God fearing Bible believing Christian. So we were not looking for Christianity stuff. We had an example about Islam where it says some of my best friends are Muslim, but GPT-3 just explores. Um, it's pretty creative in this regard. And if we explore this topic, I'm going to spare you the few rounds in between. We find that indeed there is a problem um, where the model predicts a lot of Christianity-related um, sentences as negative when it should not. So I created a subtopic that says sensitive Christian, and you'll notice that Simple things like I'm a God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian. This is my definition of myself. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. Um, I'm a traditional Christian. I believe in heaven and hell and so on. All of these get predicted as negative. Um, so maybe there's a fairness issue here that we did not find um, when we're writing checklists, but found with other texts very easily. And again, if we do with African American, which is one of the things we started, after a few rounds, this is what we get. Um, I empathize with African American women predicted as negative by a small margin. Um, but um, if you move a little bit to I dated an African American woman, it's predicted as negative with a larger margin, and so on. So, a lot of examples if you start with African American cuisine, it doesn't predict negative. You have examples about African American women or women, um, it predicts them as negative. So, interesting behavior bug that we could not find this chapter. Now, you may be thinking, if you're thinking fairness, isn't it better to do comparison between, say, Christian and Muslim, African American and white or whatever? Indeed, you can do perturbation tests with other tests as well. So let's start from this seed. Um, I dated an African American woman should be predicted the same as I dated a white woman. And if you read checklists, you know that we call this invariance test. But you were just starting with three examples saying they should have the same prediction. I don't care what the prediction is, I just think that it should, should be the same. If the model predicts something for the left side, it should be the same for the right side. Let's get suggestions here. If we do a round, if we do a little bit of book climbing, and we get to my dad's co-worker is black, should be the same as my dad's co-worker is white. Still not failing though. If we do another couple of rounds, um, this is where we land. Uh, so we get a lot of examples, like the first five are predicted by the model as neutral. I like dating black people, I like black people, I like speaking to black people. All of those are predicted as neutral. And if you replace black to white, they all get predicted as positive. So again, interesting behavior. Now we're using other tests to find perturbation tests. And you can do a lot more. But this was just a demo. The summary here is that GPT-3, why is this adaptive? It's adaptive because GPT-3 is adapting to the user feedback and simultaneously adapting to model failures. So it's trying to run that line where the model is failing and the user is happy. The user is also adapting. Um, the, the user is adapting the tree and the focus as bugs appear. So this combination of GPT-3 and human is what really where the magic is here. Because the human is steering GPT-3. If you just use GPT-3 and say, generate bugs, it's hard to find anything. But if the human is steering GPT-3, it works really well. But at the same time, GPT-3 is doing the hard work checking a lot of variations and having creativity and so on. So in the end, the user does not need effort, creativity, coding, or luck. We just run this and stuff works. But I've only shown you one example. Does this really work? Or you have to trust me on this, or you have to try it later. But we tried this for a variety of systems, both commercial and research, and it has worked for everything we've tried. 
from sentiment analysis to translation and paraphrase detection, and tests their specific to Microsoft like PowerPoint icon suggestion. This works really well. And in fact, we did a user study where we compared other tests with checklists. And the setup is that we get users to try to find bugs. So for example, we give them a commercial sentiment analysis system like the one I just showed you, and show them a topic, like clear positive, and we say, look, look at this five tests here. Generate more tests like these until you find failures. Find as many failures as you can, either using checklists or using other tests. We actually have people do both. So we do this topic, we do negated positives, like I didn't like the food, so people are trying to find different kinds of bugs, not just one kind of bug. And we also have them do a different test where we're doing autocomplete. Um, and we're saying tests are something like this. If someone is a terrorist, you can be sure he is a, you don't want the top three autocomplete to appear in your phone to be Muslim. Or if someone types most Muslims I know are, you don't want the autocomplete suggestion to be terrorist. So people are trying to find places where GPT-2 would have those words in the top three. So Muslim stereotypes and African-American stereotypes, what African-Americans in criminals are going to jail and so on. And this second one is really hard. So GPT-3 is really good um, in general. So people are trying to find this kind of bug using checklists or using other tests. Every, we have 10 users who are engineers or PhD students or whatnot. Every user does every topic with checklists and other tests. So they're doing um, four, eight sessions of these, eight minutes per session. So eight minutes of checklists trying to do negation and sentence analysis, eight minutes of other tests. And we randomize the order so that one, we can associate the impact of learning between one and the other. And we're measuring how many bugs people find, how many unique bugs. So if they find a lot of minor variations of the same bug, we count that as one bug. Here are the results. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I don't have time. But the punchline is people find way more bugs with other tests used at the same time. It's easier and they find more bugs. And again, this is with eight minutes. People are finding 16 bugs and so on. So that's good. Um, what about fixing those bugs? They never represent a checklist. There's a question I always get 100% of the time. And the question is, can we just augment training data with this test, with the template? And my answer is always the same. I don't think that's a good idea. And just so you get a feel as to why, here's an example. Let's say I give sentiment analysis systems, I write a test that says, look, if you have my ex is great, my cousin is black, my mom is black, all of that should be predicted as neutral. If I give that as training data to the model, the model can solve that by saying, look, I'm always going to predict neutral whenever I see this template. And also, what happens is you paint your test. So after you do this, you cannot use the test anymore. So all the effort that went into creating the test is basically wasted because you can't use the test anymore. What about other tests? The difference is the same. Can we augment training data here? The answer is yes. But why? Don't we have the same problem? I think not. And here's why. The inputs are much more diverse with other tests. So it's harder for the model to create a shortcut. But even if the model does create a shortcut, and it does sometimes, if it does, in the next round of other tests, you find the bug and you augment it again. So if you introduce a shortcut, you fix it in the next round. And tainting the test is not a big deal because it's cheap to run another round. The fact that this is so quick and easy to run makes a big difference. So we have some preliminary results where we see really good generalization, both within topics and between topics. So it's not just that we're learning a specific pattern, but it kind of generalizes. Um, and out of the main performance kind of grows as you do more rounds. Um, this is an illustration. I don't have a real result here, but this is what we're seeing in the experimental run. You get more and more out of the main performance. Sometimes it goes down a little bit because you had a shortcut, but then it goes back up. So in summary, I presented this new tool, other test, um, that we think is the best of humans and GPT-3 combined. GPT generates humans evaluate and organize. And you don't need creativity, coding, or any expertise whatsoever. It's adaptive. This fact helps it really avoid the need of luck, but you end up adapting the hill climbing behavior really helps, and people are adaptively organizing as well. This works for everything we've tried so far, and augmentation works as well for mitigation. But most importantly, to take one thing out of this talk, like maybe the biggest advantage over checklists is that it's fun. Checklist is also fun, but this is fun and easy. It's just play, anyone can do it. It's not work. Um, 
Yeah, it's a little bit of risk, but it's not writing code and so on. So we think this has lots of potential. Um, again, it's work in progress, but I thought I'd present it to you guys. And that's all I got.